Oh, how I would love to know the makeup of the audience. Like, are they a lot of, uh, you know, people in the reuse movement? Are they a lot of curious traditional recycling folks? Are they government? Are they concerned citizens? I think we have all, looking at this list and knowing some of the people on it, I think they are all of the above. Okay, great. That's <laughs> right. Cool. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Well, since it is too past, uh, I think I'm going to get started. So welcome, everybody. Thank you so much uh, for joining our session today. My name is Matt Prindeville, and I'm the CEO and Chief Solutioneer at Upstream. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, we help business, nonprofit, and government leaders uh, ideate, accelerate, and scale reuse and circular strategies. So today I'm really excited to be joined by my friends uh, and colleagues, Crystal Dreisbach and McKenna Morrigan. Uh, Crystal is the visionary founder and CEO of Don't Waste Durham in North Carolina. Uh, she saw the need to bring reuse to Durham and she created Green To Go in 2017, which is a community-wide reusable to-go container service. Uh, since 2019, she has been building a proof of concept that collecting and processing materials for reuse is actually possible in the existing recycling industry. And she uses her platform to build awareness and catalyze action by gathering best practices and mentoring the next generation. Crystal also won Activist of the Year at the 2021 National Reuse Awards last year. Uh, and McKenna is the Product Stewardship and Waste Prevention Strategic Advisor for Seattle Public Utilities, where she leads policy development, analysis, and advocacy around extended producer responsibility, product stewardship, and waste prevention. She's also one of the main people behind the Reuse Seattle Project, which is a partnership with the city, major sports and entertainment venues, restaurants, businesses, NGOs, and others to build the infrastructure to scale reuse in Seattle. So welcome, uh, Crystal and McKenna. It's great to have you both here. So we're, we're going to get into, into it today uh, around reuse. We also are going to look a little bit at how reuse might also impact the recycling industry. Uh, Crystal's been doing some work in that area, and we've been doing a lot of thinking about that at Upstream. Um, but to start things off, I, I really want to get into the origin stories uh, for both of you of, of how, how these projects with Durham Green to Go uh, and Reuse Seattle got off the ground. And I think with, with Crystal, uh, I'll start with you. Like, Where did this idea from, from from, for green to go happen. I know you were one of the very first pioneers and innovators in creating a reusable to go container service. So, you know, what what prompted you to want to start it? Thanks. Yes, um, it began for me when I was working in public health research in 2010, and I went out for lunch, and I got my you know my um, takeout food in a disposable styrofoam container, and my logical and organized mind just would not let go of the fact that styrofoam should not be used in food service as demonstrated by all the very well-founded research, not just health and environment, but also economics. And yet we are still using it in my town. And this was very discordant to me. It obviously in my mind required a solution. So when I looked around myself at the time, I saw programs that picked up litter, and recycled, but what I didn't see was prevention in the first place. And I've always been very passionate about prevention. It just makes sense. And uh, my vision became that reuse systems would replace the need for single use packaging. So I built an organization around preventing trash and together with a very active and supportive community, um, lots of community input sessions, we actually were able to design several solutions to replace single-use packaging, one of which was green to go for takeout. And so here we are, I quit my job in public health and dedicated myself to this movement. That's great. That's great. McKenna, what about you? I mean, how did the Reuse Seattle project get going? Yeah, thanks. Well, I, I can't claim, uh, you know, cr credit from the beginning because I'm actually uh, new here at the city um, as of this March. So the initiative predates um, my time, but had some um, really outstanding leaders and colleagues at the city. Um, and, you know, I would say really the origin is that Seattle has long been a leader in uh, recycling and composting, but really at the heart of the work at Seattle Public Utilities, 
there is a commitment to all three R's, you know, even though reduce and reuse have at times been overshadowed by recycle, um, the, the goal of advancing zero waste is at the core of our strategic business plan as a utility and um, of, at all of our work. So we really want to be out in front on reuse as well as the, the moment and opportunity for scaling reuse and really bringing it um, into the mainstream is upon us. So, um, but as a city, we know that to make reuse work at scale, to really displace the convenience and mobility that single use um, food service packaging has provided, we're gonna need reuse systems um, that that can scale like that and that can work together to be integrated so that from a user's experience, um, you know, from one of our residents or businesses, um, reuse is convenient, it's affordable and accessible to everybody in the city and it's everywhere um, in, in all pockets and parts of our city and its neighborhoods. So we um, knew that bringing this vision into reality is going to take partnerships and cross-sector collaboration. And that's really um, partly what led to the formation of Reuse Seattle as this public-private partnership. Um, and as you described, uh, it's a partnership between the city and a growing list of partners to create practical solutions and standardized systems that help us um, move citywide from single use to reuse for food service wear. Um, and starting at our major entertainment venues, um, restaurants, cafes, and more. One of the key partners in our initiative is PR3, which is an organization leading the development of standards for the reuse industry, um, and Cascadia Consulting Group, which is a longtime um, partner with the city on business engagement. But I want to be clear that, you know, Reuse Seattle is just one of a number of really exciting initiatives and collaborations that's happening around reuse in the greater Seattle and really the greater Pacific Northwest region. Right now, this is a really active and exciting time to be working on reuse. Awesome, thanks McKenna. So I, I know our audience and it's great, we've got a hundred folks here, which is fantastic. Um, and just for folks that haven't yet put your names and affiliation in the chat, that would be great. Also, we can, we're gonna ha have plenty of time for your questions. Uh, and so if as we're going along here, we'd love to just have you folks put your questions in the chat and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. Um, so I want to get into the nuts and bolts, and I would love to be able to walk, have each of you kind of walk our audience through the entire process, uh, really thinking about what does it look like for the customer? What does it look like for the businesses that are involved? Um, and McKenna, why don't we start with you this time? Sure. So, um, you know, from the start, our, our vision is to have, right, this standardized, citywide, accessible, affordable, um, ubiquitous system of reusable food service wear um, in, in Seattle. But uh, we, we've got a lot of work to get from here to there. So we're trying to be opportunistic and, um, and find opportunities uh, to make progress where we can. Um, and one of the things that we were clear about from the start uh, in terms of the city's role in this effort is that we didn't want to be in a position where we were picking winners among reusable food service providers. We want uh, to create the conditions in the city that make uh, it possible for reusable food service providers to, to um, thrive and want to come and succeed in our city. But um, we knew we couldn't do that just by, you know, picking one company to contract with and, you know, picking a, a certain venues on our own. We needed to just be focused on creating the conditions to make um, those, those market opportunities um, and innovation and creativity sort of like generate and grow itself. Um, so what we've done is we started with a registration to just solicit um, information from um, reusable food service wear providers who are interested in coming to, C in, to Seattle. And we're working to provide 
support and technical assistance to help them get started in Seattle to make connections to local businesses. We're working through our existing green business program um, to help do some of that matchmaking uh, and provide support. And uh, We've got over a dozen uh, service providers that are registered with us so far um, and continue to grow that list. But we realized pretty quickly on the journey that um, reuse can happen in a number of different contexts, and some of them are a lot easier um, logistically and economically compared to others, and some are really hard <laughs> and going to take um, a lot more work. So our early focus has been on closed venues with high volume of single use items that can be readily replaced with recyclables. So our prime target has been um, cups, beverage cups at concert venues and other big closed event spaces. And um, we've been seeing some great success. We're really excited to have uh, our cup, which is a reusable cup and food service ware vendor set up shop in Seattle this year. They've built a washing facility, um, which is where, you know, uh, reusable food service ware can get brought and washed and sanitized and then redistributed to where it's being used. And that is just been so pivotal and important for um, catalyzing further action. And our cup's done amazing work getting reusable cups launched at a number of major entertainment venues in the city in just the past few months. And we're hoping that Bold Reuse, which is another reusables vendor, um, and they're doing some great stuff in Portland right now, including at the Moda Center, at the home of the Trailblazers, starting to use reusable food service trays um, for concessions at, at that facility. Um, we're hoping that they're going to be starting up in Seattle soon as well. So we've found that getting some big anchor clients in those closed venue settings on board with reuse up front is a really important milestone and it opens doors to other smaller scale applications that might not be viable otherwise because they're just not going to be sufficient to um, you know, finance the startup of a wash facility. Um, but now that we've got that as it starts to take off, we're branching out into looking at other closed or semi-closed applications for reusable food service ware, like corporate and institutional campuses, schools, assisted living facilities, and also starting to venture into more open settings to go cups and containers at you know cafes, delis, restaurants. Um, but we know that that's a longer that's a longer term process, and getting that work at scale um, is going to happen in Seattle. But um, we're we're starting, you know. Uh, what do they say? You got, how do you eat an elephant? Like we're just taking it one bite at a time. One bite at a time. I love it. So you guys started with a closed system, which, you know, in theory would be, would be easier to do. Crystal, you, you guys, you started with an open system. Like you went straight to restaurants. And, we went and start, straight to the hard thing. Went straight I mean, to the hard thing. Yeah. The so opposite of McKenna, though we have come to the exact same conclusions. Okay. So what we did was we obviously designed something that we could upfront afford to do in a small scale way. So that was an opt-in program um, for both consumers and restaurants. And I will say um, that my conclusion is that that is not the scalable, sustainable, most impactful model that exists. And we have definitely learned that in the last um, six years. So what we did, <clears throat> And to walk, to walk you through, I will echo uh, what McKenna said that in 2017, we built an infrastructure that includes the wash facility. And that was huge because that was very mind expanding for people. And I've been shouting at street corners, literally talking to anyone who will listen to me since 2010, that reuse needs to be a municipal utility and that every city needs a large scale wash facility. And everybody thought I was crazy. We built one and finally people started to see the utility that it can support any type of reuse system, not just an opt-in one with restaurants, um, which is definitely the harder model. So part of the infrastructure was also return stations, a network of return stations across the city, which we've been growing now for six years, routes, um, and some app technology, which acts like a checkout. And in this instance, um, with green to go the, the opt-in model, the harder model, um, we provide the durable reusable containers to our food service partners that are restaurants and grocery stores. Green to go members who pay a monthly or annual fee, check them out with their app, like a library card. 
They take their food home, they enjoy it when they're ready, they return their containers to any return station in town. Um, and our staff circulate on the routes, take them to the wash facility, a very important missing piece in most cities. We're there then wash, sanitize, dried, and we restock the restaurants. So as we've come to find out, there are a number of things um, that is a challenge. So when you have an opt-in program, um, you don't have a norm for all. You have just an option for some, right? And that's what we had to start with because gosh, we needed those membership fees up front in order to get this going. But what we've quickly seen is that um, the consumers who can afford the membership are a certain type of folk. They're aware of trash, they want to take action. And according to our target demographic research, these are people who are highly educated women over the age of 35. Ha! Um, in those groups, the reception to Green to Go is very high, but most of them don't get a lot of take. Instead, they pay their membership dues. It's almost like a donor contribution because they just want to see the program exist. Thus, it becomes not a norm for all, but an option for some. And the restaurants really want solutions. Some want to stand out amongst their competitors, but the opt-in model means that reuse is not the norm for all restaurants. And that there are some independently owned early adopter restaurants willing to take risks. But to be very frank, we find the majority of restaurants really to be in dire straits in this climate and often sim simply unable to cover um, the cost, despite their great love and long participation in this program. So what we've come to find out is, um, and which is really the crux of a lot of the reuse economy, who bears the burden of cost? And I have some very strong opinions about how that should be done. So I love what McKenna is saying. Um, Seattle uh, government pairing up with the private industry to create the conditions, right? McKenna, the conditions that um, make this reuse economy possible in the city. So uh, sometime, I'd love to talk to y'all more about the takeout model that we see as the sustainable, scalable, and more environmentally impact model, uh, impactful model for food service reuse. Um, Opt-in is not it. Uh, but what green to go has done is expanded the imaginations of the community beyond mitigation and prepared their neurology for the progressively bigger and bigger impacts we're making as the 2.0 in food service reuse. So um, just like McKenna said, um, what we've found is wash services is what we're calling it, is, is uh, you know, it's these bigger venues, it's these bigger contracts that make the reuse economy possible because without those, we, can, uh, we can't keep our infrastructure alive but with those, we grow the infrastructure that makes reuse possible for all. And of course, these are closed loop systems with very high volume of reuse use, right? And it's the norm. So if you take a school district and make it the norm to have reusables, if you take a stadium, make it the norm, if you take a corporate campus, make it the norm, now you've taken it to the next level. So, yep. Um, yeah. I so I'm I'm already throwing my prepared questions out the window here because I I want to I want to I want to lean in here so I just just so you know in case we had some folks that were that are coming in here late you know what I'm hearing from both of you is that one of the things that really enables reuse to scale is having these large scale venues sports stadiums concert halls event centers and so on committing to do reuse so that that becomes the 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 minimum a viable product so to speak so you can actually justify the investment in the washing facilities and the collection infrastructure that you need and you start with those closed systems but you can build on them to do open systems and one of the things i heard you say mckenna is that you know you've got one service provider operating but you you want many service providers to come in and potentially utilize that same you know washing and collection infrastructure that's being built so i want to lean into something that you said crystal which is you know you don't think that opt in is the right model but i i want to i want to go into that a little bit more so what is the right model because you know you said a future date well let's do let's have that conversation now let's 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 lean in and you know there's lots of people on that are listening that want to figure out how to do this and so let's lean into what you think would be the best way to do it 
Yeah, thanks. This is one of my favorite things to talk about. So, you know, we're always building upon uh, what we've, what we know, the best practices we've gathered from our years of work, and then taking it to the next level. So back in 2019, we had this, uh, what was back then, a very uh, crazy idea, which was to ask ourselves, what if an entire city was reusable? what would that city need to look like in terms of infrastructure? What would it literally need to look like? And what if we didn't build a whole new system, but we worked on using things that people were already familiar with and some infrastructure that's already there. So for example, um, city trash collection, recycling collection, or the haulers that they contract um, already know how to collect and process things that people discard. And people, consumers, already know to take the things they need to discard to the curb. So we can build on this. Um, these are things already ingrained. People do it uh, you know, without even thinking. So what if we made it very easy and use this existing infrastructure? So I have a lot of strong opinions about the evolution of some government departments. It sounds like Seattle's on the way already, but I am working hard um, you know, on our local and state governments here in North Carolina to think about it this way. That isn't the management of solid waste, not just mitigation, like trash and recycling or mitigation. What if it also include prevention and reuse? So isn't, doesn't it make sense that management also includes preventing it in the first place? So what I'm trying to do is literally build this into the way that uh, the, you know, the departments are structured, the way the processes are um, for funding. And we've done some very creative things to, um, you know, get in, find the loopholes and get in the back door and help them evolve. Um, and actually they're starting to understand and get excited about that too. So back in 2019, we had this idea we need to see, we need to test what is it going to look like if the future is fully reusable, which is our vision. So you can't just have a vision and not like implement something that gathers the data. So we designed this pilot in a partnership with the city of Durham, um, which asks entrepreneurs to come and they get to pilot something for 12 weeks at a city scale. So we worked with our big MRF um, Corporation here in the region. And they allowed us to, in the city, allowed us to co-mingle. I think that, I mean, we think of co-mingling as like glass with newspaper, but in my mind, in this case, co-mingling meant put a bunch of different types of reusables into the recycling bins on a route throughout a neighborhood have them collected just like usual. <laughs> and then on the way, their routes all the way to the MRF, um, you know, where they're dumped on the floor, scooped up with a front loader, put into the hopper and up the conveyor belt, they go. Um, so now this particular pilot, obviously, for obvious reasons, is going to be fraught with issues, right? You don't want to dump reusables on the floor. You don't want to squish them. You don't want them next to a dead deer in the recycling or whatever people put in there. <laughs> but what we did gather from this is that with RFID or optical sorting at the top of the conveyor belt, you can easily pull reusables off the line and separate them from your recycling, which then they can be processed, washed, sanitized, and redistributed in in a way that makes the recycling center, the MRF, evolve to not just be, uh, you know, a seller of munched up bales, but also a redistribution center. What if they could take on this new income stream, revenue streams for them? You know, they're, they're subject to very volatile markets. What if they could have stable income? So we found that we were able to recover all these containers. And we saw which ones do the best in this gauntlet of torture that recyclables tend to go through. And we also expanded the minds of the MRF and the city. 
So these people you would think are people who just are bureaucrats or whatever, but these were closet innovators and they came up with ideas to solve the issues that we found. For example, smushing recyclables or dumping them on the floor before they go on the conveyor belt. They were innovating with us, they were ideating. And I think that's a huge impact because every time you expand your mind, you're changing your neurology and you're opening your mind to new possibilities so that when you go to define your departments and make your investments and hire your staff, you're gonna be doing something different. So then they said, yeah, 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 but what about the financial sustainability of such a thing? You know, how on earth would we make money? This wouldn't be worth it to us. We're dependent on aluminum for our main income source, you know, but we said, all right, how much would it take for you to do this? What kind of revenue stream would you need? Um, and so we got a university and a waste economist to analyze the value chain all around this circle. What are the things that make the wheel turn, right? You gotta have someone paid, you gotta have someone paying them, and then you gotta have markets for the stuff that they collect. And you gotta have the infrastructure. So how do we make that all work money-wise? So the waste economists in the university did this value chain analysis. And what they concluded is everything from Amazon shipping boxes down to itty bitty green to go, it could work financially as long as we hit a threshold of volume. And so that was very exciting. So phase three then was let's assess the volume. Let's come up with, can we show that the volume is possible with curbside collection and the end markets um, and the money involved in restocking these end markets? Is it worth it all the way around the circle? So we completed that um, this past summer and we're gonna have a live webinar to show the results of this, which is very exciting. And we started with glass. Why did we start with glass? People think we're bananas, but lots of people know the fact that there is not such a great um, market for recycled glass, some, but not huge. But there's a huge market as we've determined for reuse glass. And that is where we have um, a little bit of traction. And we've found that traction, we've assessed, we've, we have confirmed the volume, we've confirmed the end markets and our phase four now is figuring out the actual business model. Not that we would wanna do it necessarily, but we wanna publish the information so that it's available to people who wanna take this on and especially the ding dang government. <laughs> This, so this, I, I love this. This is a, a big reason why I wanted to have Crystal and, and McKenna on, on this, uh, this panel today is because both of you and the work that you're doing have expanded my own mind in, into what's possible. I remember having this conversation with you, Crystal. Um, uh, I can't remember if it was on the podcast or if we were just catching up. And you told me this idea. I'd always thought that we were going to need a separate reuse bin because I just couldn't imagine how the uh, the, the the reusables were going to survive the gauntlet of torture, as you say, um, in a Murph. And and so when I knew found out that you were doing this project, I said, "Wow, this is groundbreaking." I then found out a week later that Clink, which is a, a company that some of you might know, that is the biggest service provider for the bottle deposit system here in 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 where I live in Maine. It's also they've got a big presence in New York and some other states as well. Um, they now do refillable glass dairy bottles in the greater Portland area, <laughs> and they are sorting them off the line at their MRF on the front end. And you can get your two dollar deposit credited to your account from uh, from Clink. And so you know this is again really groundbreaking stuff. And I want to pivot and 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 shift to you, McKenna, to talk about. I mean, let's talk about this infrastructure build out because what you guys are doing is really exciting. Like yes, you're starting with these closed venues, but the, the plans, as I understand you know, are much bigger than that. And, and you've been thinking about what does the infrastructure look like for that open system out and about in parks and on city corners and an office buildings. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more um, about your thoughts around the infrastructure and how you guys are working to make this a reality in Seattle. Yeah, well, first of all, Crystal, I just have to say all of that, it, it's really, it is mind opening 
And um, there's lots to think about there. And I think it's true. We, the transition to reuse is going to require um, a, a willingness across sectors and stakeholders to be open to rethinking what we do and why we do it. And, um, you know, I, I think that there is a huge opportunity to think differently about recycling as, um, you know, the infrastructure that we've built around re recycling and really waste collection in general, there, there are um, really important lessons and a lot of expertise around collection logistics. And a reuse economy has a lot of collection logistics and reverse logistics. And we're going to need those ex that expertise. So I think that part of what what I'm working on is helping to build openness to um, uh, accepting that like the future is in reuse and that our as local governments and as service providers in the way, you know, what's been traditionally a waste industry, but what really, you know, is largely collection and sorting of materials uh, that like, those skills are really important um, for the future. We need to be um, working together and collaborating and ideating to come up because we don't know what the right solution is gonna be, I don't think, and it's gonna sort of depend on local conditions, but absolutely um, we know we're gonna have to work together to figure it out. Um, in Seattle, one of the things we've really been thinking about is, so we, we, I would say we, we're not yet ready to say like, yeah, the city should be taking this on as a, as a public utility. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't, we, we just like aren't even there yet to have those conversations. Um, but I do think that we are very aware that public place collection is going to be, uh, is going to be a necessity to support, you know, because we, there's no, there's no going back from the convenience and mobility of um, that, sing, that single use food service packaging has created in our world. That's just the reality. Um, people are going to expect that level of convenience and mobility. And I think that a reuse system can deliver that. Uh, but we need to think about how the infrastructure is there to support that. And, you know, that's not to say that people aren't going to change their behavior, because I think they are, but there are certain basic, um, you know, uh, prerequisites and, and convenience and mobility are among them. And so we are, I think, very thinking very much about how that public infrastructure around collection for on the go consumption gets built out. And I had the opportunity to visit a pilot that uh, Return It is, is running in Vancouver, British Columbia. They are the uh, producer responsibility organization for the deposit return system in, in BC. And they are running um, sort of as a interesting side gig, uh, a public place collection uh, pilot for both single use and reusable um, coffee cups in partnership with um, a number of big brands, Starbucks, McDonald's, a and and Tim Hortons have all contributed to the pilot. Um, and that's being run in downtown Vancouver. They've got 17 public place collection bins, um, 10 Tim Hortons within that same area are um, giving out these uh, cups. And you know, it's just a start. It's they're learning a lot. They're like already have, you know, a dozen things they want to change about it. But I think that it was really inspiring to see and the city is involved, but the city is not running the pilot, but the city is helping to facilitate making sure that those um, bins can get co-located with litter bins on the street, um, that they're, you know, being designed in ways that are accessible and serviceable. And that's very much going to have to be something that cities get prepared to to support and facilitate, um, because that on the go um, collection infrastructure is just going to be really important for making it possible to transition at scale. 
So I love, I love that and love those examples, McKenna. So I just want to get people thinking about their questions right now, because I'm going to ask two more questions uh, to our, to our esteemed panel, and then I'm going to turn to the chat and start looking for your questions. So as, as we're going along here, please feel free to start putting them in there and, and I'm, we're excited to get to them. Um, so I just have two more questions for you guys. One's going to be up on policy. So you can just think about that in the back of your heads for a minute. But the first one is really, a, and I ask this question a lot for those of you that listen to the podcast, you know, if you could wave a magic wand and summon resources or remove barriers, uh, what would you ask for? And I think, uh, McKenna, we'll start with you this time. Sure. Well, I think both Crystal and I have said it already, like a wash facility in every city right? Like that's the backbone of this reuse economy. So I feel incredibly fortunate that Seattle has, has had our cup come and make this investment because um, we're going to be able to do so much with that in place. And I think any city that's interested in growing um, a reuse economy, um, you know, should be thinking about that wash facility infrastructure first and making sure that it's something that can be shared among service providers, because there are a lot of really interesting and innovative, um, you know, reusable service wear applications and not every company that has a solution is needs to have or can have its own wash facility. That's nonsense. That's not going to be able to scale. So we're going to need wash facilities that can be shared across all kinds of innovators that are coming in to have reuse solutions. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, money. <laughs> like money is a barrier. Um, we did some research last year with a uh, uh, group of students from the University of Washington and uh, looking at, you know, what are the uh, barriers to equitable um, reuse systems? And that what we heard from, um, you know, from our business community and just from the, the research is that cost is a big barrier. We don't want to have, we cannot succeed in a reuse economy if only those who can afford to pay the premium can participate. We need to have it be accessible and affordable for all businesses and all residents. And right now, the issue is that there, you know, it is very difficult to compete with the economy of scale that the single use um, industry has achieved. That's just facts, you know, yeah. reuse because it's low volume, because it's new, um, it's, it's more expensive. It's, it might not always be more expensive. Um, and there are certainly like policy levers that you can pull to, to change that too. But in the marketplace right now, it's just going to be more expensive to do reuse until you can overcome some of those barriers. And so to make it possible, we just absolutely are going to need to put some money into overcoming that cost cost differential and allowing there to be cost parity for businesses, um, you know, to be participating and making this shift um, to reuse. So I think yeah. that is absolutely, you know, going to have to be a part of the conversation going forward. Very, very helpful, McKenna. Yeah, we, we like to say that that single use is subsidized on the front end with all the extraction subsidies for fossil fuels and, and for other uh, materials. And then it's subsidized on the back end with mostly taxpayers and ratepayers picking up the tab to clean up all the single use packaging. So, you know, reuse the companies like like Crystals, they have to pay full freight on the front end and the back end to get it back, wash it and get it back into circulation. And so when we get down to unit economics, um, there are some things that we need to put in place to create better uh, better fairness around the, the, the true cost of what single use is actually charging. And I'm going to get into EPR policy. That's going to be my last question for you guys both. But just, just to ask that same question to Crystal as well, uh, if you could maybe ma wave a magic wand or summon to summon resources or remove barriers, uh, what would you ask for? So at least um, in my experience in Durham, you know, there is, um, I think, a, I think a well, I would say a not high enough appreciation for the investment that K 
can be made that actually benefits the government. Um, so I think one really creative way to get things like this funded in places like ours where there's not that um, you know, line item for reuse yet is green bonds. I think uh, this is something I've been talking about with the Netherlands who does this. They, um, for example, you know, reuse is not carbon neutral, it's carbon reductive. So if you can say, you know, city, state, you have a goal to reduce carbon by this much, we can reduce it this much for you. If you pay us this bond, our contract with you is to do that. And so it's a creative way to help get some investment. And the other, the other thing is uh, fees. I do think that fees, we know from the well-founded research that fees are extremely useful and effective. So for example, in Durham, we are putting, uh, we're get, getting ready to put a 10 cent fee on single use bags. And we're behind many other states. And we've actually been working on this for something like 12 years, don't waste Durham has. But the fees collected can then go back to the solid waste management department as a line item for reuse. And now we're talking millions of dollars yep. potentially each year. So this is another creative way to fund some of the things. It's almost like a double investment. You're reducing single use bags. And on top of that, you're able to fund um, the things that make the world better like reuse. Um, so I think if I, I can add one more thing to how I would wave the magic wand. Yeah, please. Which is, you know, sometimes environmental measures, I think it's viewed as sort of a long game solution. Um, and it's maybe not as uh, prioritized. So I think that concertedly intentional and direct education of government institutions, global NGOs, donors um, can be educated. And I am a big fan of logic models. So we can help show um, that yes, in addition to the urgently life-threatening, you know, short game solutions that we need like crime and housing and feeding people and creating jobs, we can create the logic model for the reuse economy that shows how reuse is also an integral part of not just environmental, but also social and economic solutions. Um, so that this can be taken as seriously as an, among the non-reuse movement folks to show that, um, you know, these are goals we can help them achieve. And um, yes, and I'd love to talk about EPR uh, yeah. next. Yeah, well, well, let's then. do it. Cause, cause basically, you know, we've been thinking about EPR. So, for everybody that's listening in, I know we've got a very savvy audience that is, that knows EPR well. We have been advocating at Upstream for this idea that EPR really shouldn't just be about cost shifting for recycling uh, or giving local governments some relief, although that's important, but really it should be a tool to achieve a circular economy for packaging. And we in, in that scenario, we want to prioritize waste reduction and reuse systems ahead of recycling. We absolutely want to use EPR to fund recycling, but we also want to make sure that that money is, is, is being you know pushed upstream to develop some of these uh, reuse systems like you've been hearing about today. And so, you know, I just wanted to check in with with both of you on the on the role of policy. And I know McKenna, this is something that you've specialized in up in Seattle, and you're you, you folks are 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 likely working on an on an, on an EPR for packaging bill in the state house this year. Um, just want to hear your thoughts about how we could you know use EPR as a policy to help help fund and support initiatives like Reuse Seattle. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know, I think how you described the the goal of EPR in being a tool to make the circular economy for packaging real i think that's that's absolutely my perspective on what is possible i think there's been a lot of criticism of EPR that it hasn't led to design changes that it hasn't led to 
um, you know, increased recycling in certain places or upstream changes. And, you know, I think I, I am a super policy nerd. So I have spent a lot of time studying, you know, like what works and why or what, you know, cause and effect on policy. And, you know, policies like do what we design them to do. And historically, a lot of EPR wasn't designed really for packaging, wasn't designed to make upstream changes in design or to push towards reuse. The whole concept of eco-modulation to incentivize or disincentivize certain types of design, independent of how much they cost to process in a recycling system, is relatively new. You know, I mean, France has only been doing it for a couple of years and the rest of us are just talking about it right now. So I think there is a huge potential for the EPR policies of this, of this wave to be transformative for the single use packaging industry. And I am really excited to see where they go. And I think we are going to um, make a big difference. And I think absolutely reuse needs to be a part of those programs as they um, are designed and move forward. Um, you know, in terms of your question of like, how should it actually work? There are a lot of smart people working through these questions right now. I mean, Matt, I think you and I are on a working group that's asking these very questions right now. Um, so I don't think that we know exactly um, what that should look like, but we're we're trying to figure it out. And from my perspective, I think it really is important that EPR policies drive investment in reuse systems. I think that can happen through setting reuse targets. Um, I am very much a believer, and the evidence is clear that EPR programs that do the kinds of things that I think they should be doing do them when they're designed to be results based and driven. Um, driving producers to achieve results and reuse should be one of those results um, that they're required to to achieve. Um, and you know, eco-modulation, how um, how you incentivize economically beyond targets, I think can also make a big difference. And I think the combination of those things um, really does have the ability to unlock a huge amount of investment in reuse infrastructure. Awesome. Thanks, McKenna. Couldn't couldn't agree more. So, Crystal, I'm actually going to pivot to the audience questions just because we're sure. we're starting to starting to run out of time here, and McKenna answered <laughs> answered that question so well. So, you know, I just feel like let's let's move on here. But um, so one we've got one question from Andrew Ferreira, who says, "How have concerns about sanitation, especially COVID, impacted the success of programs like the Green to Go takeout containers?" So, Crystal, that is for you. I'm I'm asked that question um, quite a lot. Um, luckily for us, we have had the most amazing relationship with our local county health department. In fact, we involved them early on, long before um, green to go launched to help us design the program itself so that we met um, food code for the state. And they've been pivotal in going to bat for us at the state policy level. Um, and now it is changing to accommodate um, and support reuse on a state level. Um, they are super proud of our relationship and they call it our program, not your program. So that has been great. There's been just a lot of um, trust and faith in us. We're permitted just like any other restaurant or food service group. Um, so there's that. And we were also around and well known in the community long before COVID. So that helped a lot because people know we are synonymous with sanitization. Um, so that helps a lot. In fact, I believe uh, during the COVID pandemic, we were actually somewhat COVID proof um, in so much that the awareness of the growing kitchen trash bags um, was very, became very tangible in people's minds and they started looking for solutions and, um, you know, people were using green to go more than ever. So I love the question, you know, they're back when we had no idea how COVID was transmitted and we thought there could be transmission from surface exposure. We obviously did change our wash protocols. For example, when we spray things out, we wore um, face shields as well as masks just because we didn't know if food in the eyeballs would give us COVID. Um, 
and so that that was really the only thing that impacted us was just um being extra extra um cognizant thanks thanks crystal uh, another Can question. Can I add one thing to oh, that? Oh, sure, please. Matt? Go ahead. I just wanted to say, you know, I think there was so much very intentional, very cynical um, promotion by the plastics industry at the start of COVID to try to, um, you know, capitalize on the on the very serious um, situation, and that was, you know, frustrating to see and to ha to see the rise of single use packaging in our community. I think everybody feels it. We know it's still around. But the thing that I've noticed and been, you know, really surprised by um, is that what's holding us back now, because we have a lot of places that shifted a lot to single use, um, where they had been doing maybe durables or, you know, just more on-site dining and they're doing more takeout now, or even if they go back to on-premise on dining, they're st sticking with their single use stuff. It's not fear of sanitization. It's lack of staff. People yep. don't have dishwashers anymore. We've been doing outreach to cafes yep. and trying to encourage them to switch to durables. And they're not saying like, oh, I am concerned about the sanitary nature of this. They're like, I literally can't staff my cash register. I cannot ask my overtaxed staff to do anything more. And so I think that's just another reason why I think having wash facilities and having solutions that outsource the washing is going to have to be a part of this to scale because the labor shortages and the challenges that food service businesses have around staffing is real and it doesn't seem like it's going away. And so I think having that third party um, washing service and component is going to be a really important part of making that transition. Okay, absolutely. No, well said. So just time for a couple more questions here. We've got one from Vanessa Berry from NRCM. She says, are the reports that indicate the cost savings of implementing reusables at this level? Um, and I, I think that, that, you know, just for, she asked also for resources, uh, Vanessa, um, we actually did a, a study, uh, we did a report called Reuse Wins, where we looked at primarily the the cost savings for on-site uh, dining. But I'm actually curious to open it up to McKenna and Crystal for your analysis, because the open systems are different than on-site. Like on-site, you can absolutely save money with reusables. Like that makes perfect sense because, you know, you're you're collecting and washing them typically there. And, and you know, those, those costs, that ROI happens relatively quickly in most cases. Um, but for Crystal or McKenna, looking at at not just the the operations as they are now, because I recognize that even though Don't Waste Durham and Reuse Seattle are admirable initiatives, they are relatively small scale in comparison to what where the vision is. But just what kind of analysis that you guys have done that looks at at break even points around when things really start to be cheaper. Um, and maybe Crystal, since you've been at this for a long time, I'm going to start with you. I definitely think, I mean, this is a theme in our conversation, but it is the wash facility infrastructure and the logistics. Um, that is where you can find a lot of efficiencies. Um, and we've been documenting um, staff time and, um, you know, which is the main thing. Reuse equals labor. That's something that I think deserves an entire paper. Um, and what we've what we've found is in these closed loop systems like schools, corporations, um, and event venues and stadiums, is that um, reuse is cheaper. So we're at one school, for example, and it is our guinea pig. And what we're finding is they are saving money in one year. And if you think about it, uh, the stainless steel that we've helped them transition to um, is expected to last ten years. So the savings continue to compound upon themselves, even though they are paying us to pick up, wash and deliver every day, which is extraordinary. And it's creating a workforce um, here in our community. Um, same with uh, now that they've uh, seen it, our public school system is kind of jealous or something. And they've asked us to cost out what that would be. Now think about this. We've got 54 schools in our school district and each of them uh, use styrofoam. 
So that's 25,000 styrofoam takeout containers per day, uh, per day. Imagine what the impact could be in a year. Um, and when you make these routes more and more efficient and you have the conveyor dishwashers that run, you know, 2000 racks a minute, um, this is only going to get more cost effective um, as we grow. Um, so what we've seen is nothing but cost savings, especially in closed loop systems like McKenna and I are talking about. So I just realized that we're supposed to give you guys a break. <laughs> and I, for some reason, I thought we had to the hour and I apologize for that, but I am going to, I'm going to close us right here right now. And so um, my last question for both of you will be uh, where can folks find uh, more about you and, and connect with you? Um, if you folks want to get into these uh, these issues a little bit more, we've had both Crystal um, and McKenna's colleagues on the Indisposable podcast at Upstream, so you can check us out there. Crystal and I are also doing a live stream next week. Um, it's part of Upstream's uh, Indisposable live series. We'll be talking about the vision for this new reuse economy. We would love to have you guys there as well. So if you're not yet on our weekly email list, you can go to upstreamsolutions.org and, and sign up there and you can connect with me uh, at LinkedIn. Um, so Crystal and McKenna, where can folks connect with you and where can they find more about what you're up to? McKenna. ReuseSeattle.org. And for us, don'twasteDurham.org. Although now we're considering changing it to don't waste anything anywhere, anytime. <laughs> I, I like the rebrand. And thanks again, folks, for, for being with us for this last hour. I hope you learned a lot. And please feel free to reach out. And we hope you enjoy the rest of the, uh, the NRC. Thanks again.